I was at the Rethink Addiction Conference in Canberra last year and heard a fantastic speaker speaking about FASD. And this is an area which is really unexplored, very stigmatized, and we will be hearing a lot about this in the next session as our presenter up the back, Di, hello Di, will be speaking about a lot of this and a lot of the alcohol policy which um, is being looked to, put it, to be put in place. Adai is responsible for managing and leading various health awareness programs at, at FAIR. Dai has been actively involved with CDATS for over 18 years. She believes the most rewarding part of her work is providing communities with resources that will support them in making informed choices that are best for themselves. She also feels fulfilled in standing with and advocating for people with lived experience who want to be heard. Di graduated with a Bachelor of Public Health from the University of Wollongong and postgraduate certificates in health promotion and health management and policy from Curtin University. Prior to joining FAIR, Di worked in drug and alcohol health promotion with area health services for 15 years and has worked and managed neighborhood centers she also currently teaches at TAFE. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, the lovely Di Woods. I'll start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land. I both live and work on Gumbangia land um, up on the mid north coast. Thank you for coming today. Obviously, some of you have a long history with me and I have a long history with CDATS, it's something that I've been passionate about for a long time. And so even though I have a role that I love because I get to do change at a higher level, we all absolutely have a piece to play in that puzzle. And unless we're working together and talking together and working smarter, not harder, we're not gonna be able to make it work. And I guess I, I'm looking across the room and I can see some of you now, they're a fair bit younger than me. But you know, when I started my journey with CDATS, I kind of thought, oh, you know, some of this stuff is gonna be a long way. I can tell you some of the changes I've seen in drug and alcohol policy and in communities in my lifetime, did I ever think I would see in my lifetime? No, no. But sometimes it's about just being prepared and waiting and there'll be a window of opportunity. And that's what I love actually about CDATS. CDATS can work quickly and get the message there in those windows where governments and larger organisations can't because of the bureaucracy. And that's actually the beauty of the work you guys do. And I think the other thing that workers are workers and they're all there for a reason. I'm not saying they're not passionate, but when CDAT people come together as a group around a core value, and yeah, they might be passion, but it's a value. It's something that you guys believe in. That passion, and I say it in my workplace all the time, you can give me 50 staff, but give me a couple of people that are passionate about something, they can use skills they have and skills everybody else has in a way that's 10 times more effectively than 50 staff who aren't particularly passionate about it. So yes, it's about your skills, it's about harnessing other people's skills, but unless you've got the passion to match those skills, you're not gonna be able to achieve as much with it. So look, that, that's partly why I'm, I'm here today. So, sorry, they've given me a clicker. I'm used to having a computer. So here we go, so I will keep on time. So I'm with FAIR. What FAIR does is we kind of do that higher level um, policy stuff and create frameworks that everybody else can use and access, okay? So we can't do that alone, but we do work with a lot of decision makers, policy makers, but what we're passionate about is making sure that those decision makers put people's health first, okay? And, and that's what keeps getting missed from those conversations. We hear about economics, we hear about you know, the, the other fallout. What we want is a government and decisions that put people's health first, okay? Keep in mind though that a lot of the people, for the reasons we're here for, drug, alcohol issues, and the comorbidities that come off those, often those are the people who don't have the voice for their self. 
Every one of us needs to be prepared. And look, I know that some of you in this room will have lived experience. That's amazing, you know, and that you can harness that. And that's an absolute skill in its own right and a journey that some of us without that will never quite understand. But without every one of those voices being heard at a higher level, we won't get very far. So we look at the evidence base. That's what we there to provide. And that's what we hope we provide and bring to CDATS. We have specialists in privacy. We have specialists in marketing. We have specialists in policy. We have specialists in health promotion. But it doesn't mean we have a community voice. So, you know, again, those things that we do, they are a part of the puzzle. But without every one of you in this room and other organisations jumping on board, we can provide some of that background resources, the training and all of that stuff. But that's not th that change on the ground. We're just one piece of that puzzle. So we are doing a fair bit of health promotion and, and policy work. Some of that at the moment quite heavily is in your online marketing and stuff like that. And others is, is really around the FASD. So I'll talk about both of those. But our organisation is specific to alcohol. We don't go in the drugs, we just go in the alcohol. Why? Because we believe there's a heck of enough harms associated to alcohol for it to be recognised in its own right. So if you look at some of those stats that a person dies every 90 minutes and a person is hospitalised every three and a half minutes and one in 10 people meets the criteria for an alcohol use disorder. And then we kind of go, hmm, why are some of our politicians still meeting with alcohol industry behind closed doors? And I've heard a million times, well, you know, there's all these taxes on alcohol. I can tell you the taxes on alcohol don't even make the health bill, let alone the fallout on families, the policing and the other harms that go, go along with that. So I, I guess for, for me on a personal level, and I'll separate that from my organisation, I kind of go, you know what, as a taxpayer, if somebody is making a choice, the company or the organisation that's creating that harm or part of it, I believe needs to be accountable, not making money off everybody else's not health or misery um, or the impacts that that creates. So looking at that where we've moved to now in the alcohol advertising space is that now every single phone has become a bottle shop. Okay, And there's been a lot of advocacy over things like how do, do they check your ID if you turn up or are they just leaving it? Because there were whole loopholes in that space that they didn't have to check. If, if, you're at a pub or a club or buying alcohol, they check that you're 18. They check you're not intoxicated. You order it online, that doesn't necessarily apply. But, but the other sort of part of that is, and, and look, this is just one of what we've done, but when you compress your bottle shop phone and have alcohol delivered to you in whatever quantities you want in under half an hour, can anybody in this room actually say to me that people who experience domestic violence out there, that that's not a concern? Is that not a community concern? That somebody could have somebody heavily intoxicated at home and still order more within half an hour without any, any checks, any balances? You know, again, it comes down to we need to be speaking for those who don't have a voice in that space or who don't know where to have a voice. But we also need to be standing up actually for our own values in that space. What do we want? Does this feel right? You know, and I know that governments often make things very convoluted with long processes about how to complain about an alcohol advertisement. I just want everybody to actually just go, you know what, is this right? Even if it's not for me, is this right? If it doesn't feel right, 
yep, there might be a process, there might be a whole long list of legislations that they're asking you to cite, but it doesn't actually have to be that difficult. And, and it's not, they sometimes just like to muddy the water. So with this particular one, keep in mind that if you're an alcohol company, you cannot advertise directly to people under age. So just keep that in the back of your mind. So this is in the online space. So this particular study had 204 young people, 54 of who were under age. Now, the way that social media works is it attaches to you interests. And it keeps logging things to you and then it targets to you for what you, you want. So I might look at something and then all of a sudden things that are similar start to pop up to me. And you know what? Again, I've worked with people who go, oh, yeah, but I'm a bit older. I don't really understand that social media stuff. You don't have to understand it. You experience it every day. So the more that, and you might not have even instigated it, that some of the young people, if, you, if you're kind of looking at the board there, they were getting participants aged 16 and 17 captured 104 alcohol ads and 50 gambling ads. Yet we don't actively target children um, under those ages. So you, and that's not looking at those who are older than, than that. Okay, so they, those participants said they saw them regularly or sometimes. That is a lot of ads that are specifically targeted at you that come to you without you clicking necessarily or asking for them. Does anybody want to tell me that that's not a privacy concern? Or is there any parent in this room that wants to tell me that they're not worried? Because I think nearly all of our children are regularly online. But when we're talking about an environment which is normalising and our kids, without even clicking on it, are already seeing this stuff come up time and time again, that to me is an issue. So this is Johnny. So this is what a 17-year-old who doesn't drink and doesn't gamble um, in this study. He had 67 ads pop up and these were those, sometimes more than once. So when we're looking at what interests they assign to you, those are some of them. And I don't need to, to read you the list, but if it kind of goes, oh, okay, I looked at this once, and so she must like this and this and this and this and this, and then all of a sudden, that's what bombards you. Now given, a different scenario. Just picture in your head that there's a young person who might have looked up one or two of those. You can start to see now how they're going to get those more frequently. What if I was a bit more vulnerable? And what if I was a, re you know, drank a few times a week, a bit of a heavy drinker? Who do you think is going to get most of these ads coming to them? Is that, is that not an issue? That our most vulnerable populations who may be misusing alcohol or who might be going through a tough time and using alcohol to offset that, is it right, does it feel right that they are then targeted for more alcohol? Um, you know, we can talk about legislation, but some of this is a little bit more moral, ethical. Heaven, heaven forbid we use those words in, in this space, okay? So that's kind of some of the work that FAIR does. But whenever we speak with high-level policy makers, this is what we hear. Oh, alcohol isn't a problem. We only ever hear it from you guys. Nobody in my electorate, it's, it's not a problem here. I think our previous speaker said she'd heard, heard the same things. Again, this whole conference is about language communication and stigma. Who are the least likely people to complain? 
those who feel guilty or those through normalisation who are going, oh, well, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have drank. So, oh, yeah, well, maybe, 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 maybe there's companies and organisations out there that need to take responsibility. Maybe there's decision makers that should be putting the health of Australians first. So, but this is what we hear. So our job is to do that higher level decision making, advocacy, present the research and call them to account. But this is what we get. Oh, nobody else raises it with me. Isn't everybody drinking less? And those one liners out of context in some research report that might be 10 years old or funnily enough funded by alcohol industry. So, oh no, that's not really a priority for us. So this is what we're hearing. So the th small things that make a, a big impact, and yet we can do things like get the 20,000 petitions, but you know what? Between that time, every single person, what they can do is write to their MP. Yes, there's ways to complain about alcohol advertising or what you're concerned about, but unless every one of us is kind of just going, by the way, I'm concerned about this, our politicians go, oh, no, nobody raises it with me. So I'm going to throw down a challenge to you today and maybe to your CDAT, because if politicians and decision makers aren't hearing our messages, how often is it that you look at an alcohol advertising that I don't know, might be a little bit sexist or you think might be targeting somebody under 18 or when that ad comes up on your Facebook, who just writes a quick letter to their MP or somebody who says, you know what, this doesn't feel right. I actually don't want my child seeing this. Or, you know what, I've actually come from a home where this has occurred and this is upsetting to me. You know, it doesn't have to be rocket science, but what makes politicians listen is hearing people in their electorate and hearing those stories on the ground. So fair collect stories, but actually hearing that, and it doesn't have to be polished, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be politicians going, oh, well, actually, yeah, a couple of people raised that with me this month. That opens a door, that paves a way for people who do work, like some of our, the experts I work with, to go in and go, yep, and this is the research on it, and this is the cost effectiveness, and this is what we can do about it. How about we work together? But those conversations don't usually occur with us unless they know that people on the ground are concerned. So I will challenge you. If there's any concern you have, and I'd imagine so, because you're all here from CDATS, so you all got some level of concern, just write. It doesn't matter if it's two lines or five pages, and just go, you know what, this is really peeving me off. I'm really sick of this, or I think this is damaging, and this is why. That's all you need to do. So sending those letters or emails, Requesting meetings with politicians, that sounds daunting to a lot of people. But again, it's having people that they're supposed to be representing, again, not polished, not perfect, just going, you know what, this is upsetting to me. So they know it's real. They know that there's people behind the decisions that they're making. Okay, so making complaints about harmful practices Again, some of those things we're so used to seeing that it's normalised. I'll pull out, and I know it's a little bit off tangent, sports betting. Who saw sports betting five years ago? It might have just been out there, and now I can't turn around without it being everywhere in every commentary. It's not even an ad. It's actually in conversation now on half of our shows. And as a mother of a 27-year-old kid who loves sport, I think, oh my God, who watches rugby and NRL and AFL and basketball and boxing? And I'm going, oh my God, the amount of ads he's seeing, does it feel right? To me, no, that doesn't feel, feel right. 
Okay, so you guys do events often. Invite your politicians. And I know, I know, because I've done them and I've gone, oh, no, no, not the politician. That's not the flavour I want. But again, they will have to reflect on the policies they hold, what they're voting for, and that they're a representative of your community. They will have to reflect on that. And I can tell you, they're not going to usually let something come out of their mouth unless they can back it up. So one of the great advocacy things you can do is invite them. And yeah, say, oh, can you open it? Because being seen in that space aligns you with them. Because until now, we don't, they don't have to, and it's one of the things we're pushing for, that politicians need to say, see and document who they're meeting with and why they're meeting with them. Because there's a little bit of conversation that goes on um, that nobody knows, knows about. It's not clicking. I'm not doing it right. There you go. So look, I haven't done a flyer for you because I know each of you will have access to these presentations. So what I've done is I've put links in. So you can just press on the links if you kind of go, well, who, who is that for me? Okay. So if you want to make a complaint around alcohol advertising or harmful, harmful practices, there is ABAC. So the Alcohol Advertising, Beverages Al Advertising Code Scheme. Now, I do need to let you know, funnily enough, that's run by industry. Okay, so it's industry regulating industry. And, well, if you breach a code, get a kind of slap on the wrist. But they're in place because they sort of say, oh, but nobody complains to us. Now, look, I'm not here to make you kind of feel, oh, but, you know, we go through these processes and nothing really happens. Because, you know, if you carbon copy in FAIR or your MP or whatever, they might kind of go, oh, well, that's not really targeting 18-year-olds even though it's got a lovely fluffy Bundy bear and humour that appeals to young men, but 51% of your target market might be 18 plus. So therefore it's advertised at adults. So there's a lot of gray areas, but and we're not going to be able to change and get other people with, who put the health of people first and health representatives and things around that table unless people start complaining. If people start complaining, they are then getting reviewed for what they've done with those complaints. While we let it sit and they go, oh, well, we've only had 15 complaints this year, they just go, it's not really an issue. We're doing a good job because no one's complaining. So that means all alcohol advertising is nearly meeting all the requirements that it's set to do. But again, it's, does this feel right? Are those codes what we as community members think are right? Um, you know, so just, just thinking about that, that, but look, that is the correct ways to, to make those complaints. And I encourage you to do so, but I would also encourage you at the same time to go to write that five lines to your MP and kind of go, yeah, I have complained, but really? Should I be complaining about this? Um, is there not anything further that should be being done in this space? Call them to account for that. So we've talked about some of that. So look, FAIR do have a newsletter for any of you interested. I guess what we do is we do do a lot of research. We do do a lot of policy. So sometimes there's lots of opportunities there for your CDATs when the government are asking for feedback to certain things, use those papers that somebody else has already written. You don't need to do your own research. You can kind of go through and go, actually, this one and this one are huge for our community and just use some of those, those arguments because otherwise it becomes too big a hurdle 
to kind of go, okay, well, how do we even do this? How do we structure this response? You know, and some of that puts people off responding. Don't let it put you off responding. Just do it. So looking at pregnancy and alcohol a little bit. So some of that is from the Ottawa Charter. So if you work in any of those spaces, that will make change. That has the opportunity to make broad scale change and longer term change. So some of that we're gonna do in a little while today, looking at pregnancy and alcohol. So why is pregnancy and alcohol a concern? And look, I know not a lot of CDATs and LDATs are working in this space. I think there's still this assumption that you need to be an expert to do it. It's not, it's actually a conversation. That's where awareness starts. It starts with a conversation. So we know that it's a tetragenic or poisonous substance and it crosses the placenta. That's at any stage of pregnancy. So some of you may have heard different things. There's a lot of things that go, oh, you know, no, it's really around the first few months. Any alcohol, whether it's in big amounts or small amounts at any stage in pregnancy can, can affect um, an unborn child. So again, coming back to the health of our population, that's about informed choice of a, a mother and a family. They need to have that informed choice. And sometimes there's just assumptions. And again, I heard um, our previous speaker sort of say, oh, but you know, we're told that that's not an issue or that report didn't, didn't occur or, or whatever. And there's so many mixed messages in that space. And this is why FASD presents quite differently because alcohol can have an impact at any stage. So it could look like a facial abnormality, but it could also be something like um, a memory impairment because it depends what stage of development that baby um, is. But it, we also know that obviously the risks increase with the amount or frequency of alcohol use. But there's a lot of women, it, we don't make the assumption, don't go under that stigmatised way of thinking that it's only people with alcohol substance use disorder who this is a problem for. This is actually an entire community problem. So, so I've just put up there different, different ages and stages. So you can kind of get a sense there of depending on what's developing, that may be what's, what's affected, okay? And it can be prior to pregnancy as well. I, I, so, and look, I, I did get asked about this last night. So that's kind of why FASD presents differently in different people, because it depends the age and stage for what might be affected okay so i won't go too heavy into the science though so what does that mean is this just an issue for pregnant women okay what about people living with fasd because there's a lot of misdiagnosis sometimes it's cognitive impairment sometimes it's adhd but often it's not necessarily the correct the correct diagnosis okay so it could be physical and emotional development delays it could be impaired speech it could be any any of those things the sad part is it's completely preventable if we don't drink alcohol through pregnancy it's completely preventable okay so 35 percent of women consume alcohol while pregnant now, I know that sort of sounds alarming, but for those of you who are mothers and have carried a baby, how many weeks were you before you knew you were pregnant? So again, there's conversations before you are. If somebody's planning a pregnancy, we can be having this conversation. Um, how many pregnancies are planned though? You know, so this needs to kind of be a community. And, and it's not disempowering to women. It's how we have that conversation. Because it's okay, you found out you're pregnant today. Okay, you know what? Let's do this now for your baby. Don't worry about what can't ha change. 
but let's reduce the harm from this point forward. Let's support that, that woman. We do know that some women will choose to, to continue drinking, but there's a lot of women who are unfortunately still being told, oh, you know, a little bit of alcohol, that's not going to hurt from friends, but also from GPs, gynaecologists, midwives, from people who kind of go, oh, but the risk is so small. Tell me how small the risk is. I'm a mother. I don't care how small the risk is. This is my child and my informed choice. Again, it's around women's or families' rights to, to know about that. And it's been clear, I guess, with, with our messaging. Not, oh, well, you know, it's kind of a small risk because there's many women that I work with in that space who aren't heavy drinkers and maybe through their pregnancy just had one or two every week or so. And that was the medical information that was given to them at the time. So that's why the alcohol guidelines are, are clearer now than they were a few years ago. So I, I'll just raise that as well because I have had people, and I don't mean to cause offence, but have had, oh, but that must be in communities where they drink a lot or women with substance use disorders. And I've had doctors say to me, oh, that's not my time. It's not, not the women I see. And I'll go, how do you know? Have you asked? Have you asked if they're drinking? Have you thought to have the conversation? And sometimes it's not. It's just that assumption. But when we look at that... It's usually more likely to be older, married, of higher education and Caucasian. Now, who would have thought? But you know what? With so much mixed messaging, and the more money you have, the more access you have to buy alcohol. And so it doesn't have to be that high level. So keep that in mind when, if you're looking at programs in that space, okay? So it's to prevent harm from alcohol <laughs> to their unborn child not to drink alcohol. And breastfeeding not to drink alcohol is the safest option for baby. So there are some strategies where your breast milk can be free from alcohol, but at the end of the day, your blood alcohol concentration is exactly the same as the blood alcohol concentration in your milk. But when you think about the, the brain development and liver development of a newborn or an unborn baby, doesn't have the capacity to metabolise that like we do. So obviously the harm is going to be more. Okay, so this is Nikki's story and I'm just going to play it for you. Now, Nikki is the carer, so she's a foster carer. Uh, his shoe doesn't fit him properly. He's got a bit of a sore eye. The internet's a little bit slow. It doesn't matter what it is. Very low tolerance to anything that frustrates him and which often leads to uh, hysterical tantrums, unbelievable language and name calling, physical threats and sometimes violence. On the other hand, he is a nice little boy and he really wants to do well and he tries so hard to do the right thing and I'm going to cry because I see what, what potential this little boy has. Imagine what it's like to have a child who you love, who you get up to in the middle of the night, who at the age of 11 still has night terrors because of the damage to his brain. It's about getting the message out to the world that this is the alcohol. It is a toxic substance. And when it is used in the wrong place in the wrong time, it has devastating effects. So you can see now the importance. We can talk about the research. We can talk about the stats. But it's not about the stats. This is someone's life. This is a lot of people's lives. And it's lifelong. 
So look, sea dats can do a lot of things there. And so coming back to some of the Ottawa Charter things that I showed you, there's lots of capacity building. It depends where your sea dat is at, what capacity you have around the table, what resources you have, and where your community's up to. You know, you don't have to change the world tomorrow. It might just start with a bit more awareness that this is a thing. It's not a figure of someone's imagination. This is a thing. This impacts families. It might just be a conversation. It might be just starting, changing and reducing the stigma in, way, in, in the way people speak. It can be looking at things like FASD Awareness Month, which is September, and jumping online with other FASD Awareness things. Red Shoes Rock is one of those. Um, there's multiple buildings being lit red. I shouldn't get political, but I've got to say, so far, none of the Sydney venues that belong to the New South Wales government are being lit red. Every other state, they are. So I can't say much more about that, but it would be great to have CDAT support if you know any venues that may be happy to support um, the awareness initiative. Okay, so building sustainable collaboration. So there is online training there available. We do have fact sheets available. So if anybody decides to do a program in this space, those resources are already there for, for you, okay? For those of you who work with a large percent of Aboriginal population or with Aboriginal organisations or with Aboriginal clients, there's strong born. So NACHO, which is a peak body who works with ARCHOs, Aboriginal Community Controlled Organisations, there's resources specifically and culturally appropriate for conversations um, with those communities. So if you're looking for inspiration, um, there's Red Shoes Rock, and I've put a few links on there. Um, and I know that some of the CDATs in this room right now are doing some projects in, in that space. So these are just some of what CDATs, LDATs, community groups have kind of done, everything from rock art, because I mean, then you're sitting with people and still having conversations to painting nails red again, one-on-one -on -one conversations and awareness, people asking, what, what are your nails red for? Down to some of those more artistic ones or chalk art or lighting, different red lightings. Your opportunities are endless, okay? You just have to work out what works for your community. So there is an organisation, no FASD, who does do presentations and also has training there for you. Okay, so look, I know I went through that pretty quickly, but I know there's also a lot of expertise in this room. So I want to, or I'm asking you to start thinking about, so I'm going to stop presenting there because what I want us to do is start looking at what this means for our community because it's are very under-recognised. When we're talking about, um, in Australia, 2% of our population might have a FASD diagnosis. We talk about under-diagnosis, okay? For our young people living with FASD, they are 19 times more likely to be in juvenile justice or in trouble with the law. And that's not a community issue. Maybe if we come and step back to prevention and early intervention, um, when we look at those comorbidities that so often go along with FASD, which are drug use, which are mental health disorder, this is a piece in that puzzle. But until, until we start diagnosing correctly, and there's a whole heap of barriers to that, but we can be making a change, we can be preventing that. So what I'm going to ask you guys to do in a minute is I'm, I've put some papers on and you should have or you will have a project officer at your table. So they'll be your table host. I want you guys to start brainstorming um, on some of those things. So what we will do, and don't, don't do it yet because you're going to be moving tables for this. So you're going to do two sheets. It'll take you about 15 minutes. And then you're going to change to a table. Don't move as a table. I want you to go to a random table where nobody else on your table is at. And then you'll do a next piece of that puzzle. 
this is the way that we collaborate. It helps everybody be able to contribute. If you don't want to talk out, you write on, on the post-it notes and you stick it where it goes. This is about harnessing every skill on your table. All right, so on the first sheet there that you have with your, with your table host, I just want you to spend a couple of minutes of saying why FASD or alcohol and pregnancy is important to you, your community or your CEDAR. That should only take you a couple of minutes. Then think about who wants to be involved or who will be interested because if this isn't a conversation now, who might be of interest around that table when you start? Okay, guys, still staying at the same table you're at. But the next sheet is brainstorming what the resources are that you've got in your community. Now, I've put up a, a sheet on your screen. Sorry, I keep wanting to look at the screen. So that might help spur you with ideas of what is it in your community that you can harness around this issue or make it work. There might be great parks in your area. There might be great drug and alcohol in your area or, you know, a neighbourhood centre that, that is specifically designed to work in that early intervention space. Start brainstorming who, who might be around that table for you, what physical assets are there. Okay, so at your second station, your table host will give you a 30 second rundown on what previous conversation was. Then you'll start looking at what activities might be useful, who might you target, what strategies. And I want you to, kind of, yeah, there might be multiple strategies, but you know what, this isn't just about pregnant women. This might be about partners who support pregnant women. This might be about stakeholders. This might be about community awareness. Whatever you want. And it doesn't mean that you have to do broad scale. It could be how you could work with somebody on an individual level, a family level, a community level, any of those. Off you go. Thanks, guys. I'm going to stop you there. So again, I don't want you to go to another table with anybody else on your existing table. I want you to move again to another table. And I'm going to get you to start looking at what's on the table for any patterns that are emerging where you kind of go, oh my God, yes, I can see that this and this and this link up. I want you to start coming up with a key four ideas that have come from that table. Okay, sorry guys, now with your four key ideas that you have there, I want you to consider, and I've put it up on the board there, I was going to get us to plot it, but I won't. I want you to consider a couple of things. One, the, the, of the four ideas you've got, which would have the biggest impact on your community or the outcome that you're wanting to have? And two, how much time, effort or collaboration is that going to take? 
And I want you to look at it in that matrix. So if something's not a lot of effort, now keeping in mind a lot of effort depends on who's around the table or who you can harness or what the assets in your community are. So this might be different for different seed ads. But have a look at how much, the, how, how much effort versus how much outcome. If it's a lot of effort and a great outcome, consider it. If it's actually not that hard to do and it's a good outcome, then that's the one you should absolutely go for. If one is really creative and might be good, but it's going to take a lot of effort and you may not have those skills around the table and you're not sure about the outcome, don't worry about that one. But I want you to come up with one of your key ideas that is your piece of gold that you think would be the best one to take forward. And I'm just going to give you about two minutes to do that and then I'm just going to run around the tables and share. Okay, can you stick up your table's hand if you think that you've got the main key outcome of your table group? One. Only one. Two. Three. Beautiful. Four. Perfect. All right, well, I'll start there. I'm just going to walk around with, with my mic and I'm going to ask someone on your table, not the table host, to share what the key, the key project idea is that you have. Is this on? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to start with this table. And I'm going to pick Bryony. I always pick the ones that refuse to give me eye contact. It's like the naughty kid at the back of the room. <laughs> so, Bryony, do you want to share what, the, what one of the main project is from yours and why? Uh, so we had FASD info needs to be readily available, accurate and consistent, easy to understand, free and in multiple languages and culturally appropriate because we felt that that would be easily applied to all different communities, whether they're big or yeah. small. Yeah. Perfect. And the Multicultural com Communications Health website does have information and pregnancy in about 18 different languages ready for you to go. There you go. All right. Heather. Um, our gold was, um, <laughs> came about after lots of discussion. Uh, we were keen to look at social media um, in the way of looking at um, having TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. Um, the subject would be promoting awareness and education of FASD. Um, I can't quite read what this part says. Um, my <laughs> um, the, the reason for the social media decision, it, it was coming a lot, um, mainly to just reach a broader audience as well. So some sort of campaign that would have um, visuals, harms associated and a few links uh, for resources, services that can be accessed, that kind of thing. All right, and just so you know, there will be FASD awareness kits that are released probably in August that will already have templates of those for you. And there should be animations also released August-ish, if that makes it easier. Ooh, everybody's got their tags hiding on purpose. <laughs> okay, who wants to do it? I'll pick you. M me. <laughs> Oh God, is this, um, okay. We went with the um, alcohol-free events like um, family fun days um, that, well, we have them in our community where multiple different agencies um, take um, 
participate in making it an absolutely fabulous day for um, everyone available. There's lots of freebies. We've got um, CDAP, we've got the uh, people that from the library that um, do the toys, Lions Club, the fireys, the police. Um, there's multiple different agencies that come along and we are thinking that we could um, incorporate like have a, a section there where that might be um, a, a, a great benefit to uh, you know like an extra stand but we could also do we thought um, there's always um, storytelling and um, uh, Certain people read stories to very, everyone sits down and listens. So maybe that could be a story about, you know, no alcohol in pregnancy and that kind of thing. Um, we thought the GPs, midwives, um, people like that could um, be involved as well. Uh, and, and we could just widen uh, the uh, people that we've already uh, invited to participate in making this a fabulous day for um, the, the community as a whole. Is that it? Yeah. And also some um, targeted education sessions. Yes. Oh, targeted ed education sessions. We didn't know how we'd do that, but um, we thought even like with the... Um, storytelling or the uh, whatever we could incorporate it in different um, sections of, of the of the fun day yeah or have it as a separate um, um, uh, activity, activity. <laughs> thank you so I love that, especially they're using those assets of your community, especially events that you've already got families at that are already not stigmatized there's so many times I've seen drug and alcohol stuff advertised and I think, oh, if everybody goes, oh, shit, they're going to see me there, people aren't going to turn up. So what a great way of reducing that stigma and starting that conversation. Great, great job. Okay. All right. Did anybody have something different and pressing that they wanted to share? Because I'm looking for those out there. Oh, they're waving at me over there. Hang on. Because I have been told I'm not allowed to break into your lunch because you're all mass exodus for lunch. Lindy. Yep. Okay. Um, so we talked about the fact that there are already lots of resources that have been developed they're informed, they're evidence-based, they're lived experience-based, all that kind of jazz. So maybe it's CDAD's role to actually get that information out there. So we're sort of printing it off, if that's what it takes, <laughs> and going out to our GPs, going out to our community centres, going to events and just going, hey, there's resources available. We're just connecting you with information that's already there. Um, and also coming together as statewide, you know, CDATs across the state and advocating together to put more power behind it. Because it's really lovely to do our local campaigns as well and making sort of having those localised solutions to things. But coming together as a CDAT and going to, you know, is it going to NESA? So our New South Wales education standards and going, hey, we want more information about FASD in the curriculum you know, we know how to get pregnant. We know generally that you can't have drugs or alcohol during pregnancy, but I would say my generation doesn't know why. We don't know the consequences. But maybe if we're coming together as a New South Wales wide CDATS and going, this is what we collectively, all the organisations and communities that sit on CDATS want, work with us kind of thing. This isn't just one CDAT, you know, Wagga Wagga, we've got 50,000 people. Uh, it's the whole statewide. I think that would be really impactful. Now, I did also notice one or two of you had something like webinars or training as well. So the group No FASD do do that. Um, and I know for those of you who kind of said, oh, but the storytelling would be great. They also have a wide network of people who tell their story and share their story, which is great. If you need to be linked in with anybody who you think, oh, I don't know a speaker in my area, please sing out. I might not know that person, but often we know people who know people. So I can start those feelers for you. Uh, 
Uh, we also agreed on the social media, like a bit of a clickbait with a picture linking to a FASD fax on prevention and more information. But to think of something different, we were also thinking about Year 7 and 8 students, if, if the CDATs were allowed to um, engage with that group on that day, the schools having their rubella injections or their... Um, uh, yeah, HPV um, injections, that they have, have take that opportunity while they're speaking about um, pregnancy and why they're having these treatments, um, they can talk about FASD and have an opportunity. But the, the CDATs have a guest speaker in because they've got a collective audience and it's usually girls on their own, the boys aren't there. But the boys need to, to hear, hear about it as well. But... Um, so that could be a, definitely um, a place to, while the girls are actually thinking about, you know, I want to have this beautiful, perfect baby. Um, I don't want to have behaviour issues. I don't want it to look like this. I don't want, um, you know, because they, they, they do have that perfect picture for their future, especially these girls in this generation. I've got a 14-year-old, so I know we're picture perfect, the perfect everything, they, um, um, the looks matter to, this gen to that generation. Okay, I'm getting the evil eye from the other corner, so I'll wrap it up there. But look, thank you. And to those tables I didn't quite get to, look, your, your table host will type up, I guess, some of the ideas that you've put forward. I hope that you'll actually... I hope that you'll actually use some of the, those ideas to look as you come up to your next funding round. Now you know what's there, and now you know how easy it can be to start some of those conversations. Thanks guys for all those inspiring ideas. <laughs>